Hey everyone, the total solar eclipse here in the United States on Monday, April 8th, was a generational event which required some planning, travel, and logistics for NASA Public Affairs to get to the path of totality in some places. So it was a pretty quiet week for news updates. There wasn't much in the way of new status, but there was a little bit of detail on Orion testing for Artemis II and a couple of events that relate to the future of Artemis many years from now. The United States and Japan signed an agreement this past week formalizing plans for Japan to build a pressurized lunar surface rover. The hope is that will be ready for delivery to the moon early in the next decade. The last Delta IV rocket successfully launched this past week, and it's a reminder of one of the constraints for the Artemis Moon to Mars programs this decade. NASA is using a modified Delta upper stage on the initial version of its Space Launch System rocket, but Delta production is over and there are only two more stages they can use until the custom-built SLS upper stage and new mobile launcher are completed. The Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, in its 2023 annual report, suggested that NASA spread out the test objectives packed into the early Artemis missions, but the dilemma for the space agency is that there's not enough rockets yet to fly more Artemis missions. The plan is that once the SLS Block 1B upgrade and infrastructure are available, regular flights would begin in the next decade. But Congress only bought enough hardware of the version that flew Artemis 1 for two more launches. There was also another release of pictures and videos surrounding the early April move of the under-construction Artemis II Orion spacecraft into an altitude chamber for integrated testing. So let's take a look at all that. The United States and Japan formally signed an agreement for Japan to build a pressurized lunar rover for Artemis. At the same time, it was announced that two Japanese astronauts will be assigned to future Artemis missions, and one would be on a lunar surface crew, as opposed to crew members that would stay at Gateway with Orion. The plan is for this rover to be ready to be delivered early in the next decade, in time for use by the Artemis 7 crew when they get there. But that's the kind of time scale they are talking about here. Artemis 7 is currently planned for no earlier than 2032, and with the natural movement of schedules could be almost a decade away. So there's a long time to learn more about a lot of the technical aspects of the capability. It was noted that the US will provide the transportation of the rover to the surface, and also that it was likely to use the commercial cargo service that NASA intends to contract with the two HLS providers, SpaceX and Blue Origin. The Orion program released imagery surrounding the early April move of the Artemis II spacecraft in the altitude chamber at its Kennedy Space Center production site. The Artemis II Orion quote-unquote short stack, which is the mated crew and service modules, along with the spacecraft adapter cone, is going through final assembly and test by prime contractor Lockheed Martin in the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building at KSC. This is the second set of imagery released. I went over the initial release in last week's video, which I'll put a link to above. Lockheed Martin assembles and tests Orion spacecraft in the IOZ, the Industrial Operations Zone of the ONC building, and this past week, on April 11th, some time-lapse footage of the move was published by NASA. NASA Public Affairs also published a feature about renovation of the altitude chamber on the same day, noting that it was the west chamber that was renovated. In the footage, we first see the spacecraft lifted up out of the final assembly systems test cell, fast cell for short. The feature notes that's a 30-ton crane lifting the spacecraft out of the cell. The short stack is moved out into the aisleway, then down the aisleway towards the west altitude chamber. The spacecraft is lifted up towards the ceiling to make it over the railing at the top of the two chambers, and then it is moved over the top of the chamber and lower down into the chamber.
We then see this move from the point of view of the altitude chamber area. As the spacecraft is lifted up, you can see the bottom of the service module, including the orbital maneuvering engine and the auxiliary thrusters, and also the white insulation covering the bottom of the module. Airbus recently posted an image showing work on that insulation. Those are called flexible external insulation mats. Next is a view from the top of the altitude chamber as the spacecraft is lifted up, over, and then in. And then finally is a time lapse from inside the cell looking up at the ceiling where we can again see the tail of the spacecraft as it is moved over the chamber and then down into it. You get an up close view of the eight auxiliary thrusters with red protective covers over the nozzles and the OME nozzle as the video ends. A still of the short stack was taken on Wednesday, April 10th and was also released at that time. Looking down, we're mostly presented with a view of the crew module with the closed hatch at kind of the 6 o'clock position, windows and RCS thrusters covered up, and as the file name says, flip up platforms in their up or raised position. The electromagnetic interference and compatibility testing also started on the 10th. We can see that some of the areas like the hatch aren't fully taped yet, and it's also more obvious that the forward bay cover is not installed. We'll see if those are installed for the vacuum tests that would be coming up in the summer. A few more still images from inside the IOZ that were taken when the Artemis II crew's family walked through the facility in mid-March were also published. The new shots were of the Artemis III and Artemis IV crew modules as they appeared a month ago. The Artemis III CM is in the CM workstation to the east of the clean room. It's covered with protection for possibly electrostatic discharge, but that's also export control protection, so the only thing that is visible is structure. The Artemis 4CM is still mostly structure, and it is seen in the birdcage support structure. Those are relatively new views of those spacecraft, but not much new is known about the status of assembly and test for Artemis 3 and 4. At least as of this recording on April 12th, we haven't got an update on the status of ESM-3 and when that will be ready to ship to KSC. We also got a more recent shot of Building 4708 at Marshall Space Flight Center showing preparations to move an engineering development unit of the payload adapter for SLS Block 1B. The payload adapter is sometimes also known as a payload attach fitting. This engineering development unit is being used for structural testing, and these shots in March are about a month after a recent one showing the same unit alongside the two Orion stage adapters for Artemis 2 and 3. Now we see that the OSA for Artemis 2 has been wrapped up, presumably for eventual shipment to Kennedy Space Center. Second stage LH2 secure at flight level. Minus 30. Status check. Go Delta. Go NROL 70. On Tuesday, April 9th, the last Delta IV successfully launched the NROL 70 payload 
for the U.S. National Reconnaissance Office. Minus 15. Row for ignition. 10. T minus 10, 10 9, 8, 8 6, 7, 5, 6, 4, 5. We have ignition. 2, 1. one. Left off. And liftoff of the final United Launch Alliance Delta IV heavy rocket carrying NROL-70 for the National Reconnaissance Office and closing Delta's six-decade legacy of excellence in space. Flying in its Delta IV Heavy configuration of three common booster cores and the Delta Cryogenic second stage, the all-liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen launch vehicle lifted off at 12.53 Eastern Daylight Time, or 16.53 UTC, from Pad 37B at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. But there is still United Launch Alliance Delta hardware waiting to fly. The two interim cryogenic propulsion stages that ULA built under contract with NASA's SLS program. Known as ICPS for short, the stage is a close copy of the Delta IV DCSS. The main physical differences are noted in this ULA graphic, a stretch LH2 tank and an extra attitude control system hydrazine storage bottle. As it also notes, there are additional modifications to interface with the Orion and SLS flight control systems and for crew rating of the stage for Artemis II and III. Those two stages are complete and in storage at ULA's Delta facilities at the Cape, waiting until NASA is ready to fly Artemis II and III. I went over the status of the two stages in a recent production status video for Artemis II, III, and IV. There's a link to that up at the top if you're interested in a lot more detail on that. ICPS is a part of the initial operating capability for SLS, serving as an in-space stage for the Block 1 vehicle. But the I stands for interim, and the stakeholders for SLS have always wanted a bigger rocket. So much so that they are going to retire ICPS and Block 1 before the first upgrade is complete. The upgrades for Artemis 4 won't be ready for another five years at least, and with only two more vehicles of the initial interim capability, Artemis 2 and 3 may have to cover the rest of this decade. NASA and Congress have never really said why the space agency cannot continue to use Block 1 vehicles to fly Orion missions to the moon until the upgrade with the Exploration Upper Stage and the Block 1B is online, but that's been the plan for a long time. The obvious assumption is it's too expensive to do both. ICPS and Block 1 were given an extension in 2018. Before that, the plan was to fly Block 1 only once. Even at that time, there was a choice between an extension and the upgrade. That extension paid for two more Block 1 vehicles, and it also started a new mobile launcher for the SLS upgrades, Block 1B and Block 2. But it also stalled development of Block 1B, which went into a redesign cycle. Block 1B and Mobile Launcher 2 won't be ready to fly Artemis 4 until the end of 2028 at the earliest, so the pace of missions is going to remain slow through the 2020s. The five-year anniversary of the Artemis brand name introduction is coming up next month, and for what it's worth, the path it is taking bears a resemblance to what happened with the space station program, especially when it comes to how long it took for the government to lay out all the groundwork for a capability that could be utilized. President Reagan pretty famously proposed space station freedom in the 1984 State of the Union address. That space station concept was ambitious, and Reagan directed NASA to make it permanently manned within a decade. Instead, by that time, it had turned into the International Space Station, a downsized combination of NASA and Russian space station modules, and only after barely surviving a cancellation attempt in 1993. ISS was downsized again with modules canceled early in the 2000s, just after the first expedition started permanent occupation. It was essentially 25 years after Reagan's speech, at the end of the 2000s, that the crew size increased to six to enable utilization. Artemis could be looking at similar, if not longer, timescales. Constellation started in the mid-2000s. Congress was the one that tried to cancel ISS, but it survived. 
In 2010, it was instead the White House canceling Constellation. This year is also the 20th anniversary of President George W. Bush's Visions for Space Exploration speech. When he made that speech, it had been 20 years since Reagan's space station speech. Although stalled by the STS-107 Columbia disaster, ISS in 2004 was at least a little farther into assembly than Artemis appears today in its development. A key difference is that half of the Artemis Moon to Mars programs are services being developed by industry. NASA will only use those services, but that also means the government is not the sole investor. The hope is that we'll begin to change the dynamics of the past, and those hopeful schedules currently say we'll see some realization of benefits before the end of this decade. Right now, we're still waiting to see when that will happen. Starship HLS was supposed to be making its uncrewed landing demonstration on the moon by this time, but it's going to be at least two years late, and the latest estimate was more like four years late. So we're also seeing delays to the aspirational schedules from commercial services, too. Although the circumstances are different, we'll see whether Artemis remains on this familiar pace of progress that we saw with ISS for its first 20 to 30 years. That's all for this time. Thanks as always for watching. This is also the anniversary of the first space shuttle test flight in 1981, with launch on April 12th and landing on April 14th. We still have that list of watch items, particularly for Artemis II this year, and we're waiting to hear what comes next. I'll put the link to the recent status video up again at the end here. It will come up in the customary YouTube last 20 seconds.